Today in our study of the book of Jonah, we come to chapter 2, where Mike just read for us. And chapter 2 of the book of Jonah is what I am calling the best of the worst of Jonah, his experience, and his book. We saw last week, and we will see again in the next two weeks, that there's not a whole lot worthy in Jonah, the man, or this account of his life that's worthy of our emulation. I mean, frankly and bluntly, Jonah is a jerk. Jonah is a bad person. Jonah is not a nice guy. Jonah is a horribly disobedient follower of God, for good measure. We saw last week God give Jonah a direct and clear command. God gave Jonah, the prophet of God, a direct and clear command. Go to the large city of Nineveh. Leave the comforts of Israel. Leave your own people and preach to these foreigners the message of repentance from their sins and, then, and invite them to turn to God. Jonah, as we saw last week, he not only does not go to Nineveh, not only does he not do what God has called him to do, but instead he goes in the complete opposite direction. He tries to run to the far ends of the world in Tarshish. But of course, he does not escape the sight or the reach of God. God brings upon him a tremendous storm upon the waves upon which Jonah is trying to escape upon. And Jonah, in his rebellion, he puts everyone's, life's, everyone's life on the line. And everyone in that moment does, does what we would at least expect them to do. The pagan sailors, for instance, they are the ones concerned about life. They're especially concerned about the life of the sin-filled Jonah, who's bringing all this calamity upon himself and upon them. The sailors do everything that they can do to save Jonah's life, but God makes it abundantly clear that it is Jonah's life and that it is Jonah's rebellion, more, more uh, particularly, that, it, that is the reason for this deadly storm. So the sailors, they are faced with no other option but to throw Jonah overboard. And when they do, the storm immediately ceases. But Jonah's trouble, it is only beginning. Because now Jonah is sinking fast. He's sinking into the muck and mire of the ocean deep. And of course, sinking fast in the ocean deep, is, it comes with a very short life expectancy. And what we have here in chapter 2, in the past tense, is what Jonah did as he sank into the ocean blue. What he did is Jonah called out to God. In this moment, Jonah calls out to the same God who, from which he is running away from, the same God who gave him the call that he is blatantly denying to go to the Nineveh nights and preach so that God could save them. Now Jonah is calling that, that God would save him. And God in his great grace preserves Jonah's life. And he does throw so through a grand fish, not necessarily the whale that we often think of, but the original language just says that God uses a large fish to save Jonah's life. In chapter 2, what we study today is Jonah's prayer and his praise from inside that large fish's stomach, where we spent the three, what I'm sure were three very long days. And as we begin to look closer at this prayer and praise, we should do this noting that it is the best of the worst of Jonah. That this is the best side of Jonah that is presented in his book and in this experience of his life. As I thought about this, I kept thinking of Sports Center for some reason. I think, of, I think we are all at least somewhat familiar with the ESPN show Sports Center. Sports Center, each night, it recaps the day in sports, and it has a long running facet of the show, which is known as the Sports Center Top 10 Plays. The top 10 plays are 10 of the best plays from that day in sports, like this of great slam dunks and catches and baseball and football and every sport that has video upon the sport. But then SportsCenter also has another long-running facet of it, which is the not top 10 plays. The not so great plays. They are the best, but they are the best of the worst. Plays like this that are near misses and embarrassments. And as I went throughout this week, I thought that Jonah chapter 2 fits this category. This part of his journey is the best of the worst. In this passage, in this prayer, in this praise by God, or praise by Jonah to God, we see a lot of good in Jonah. Some things that we can learn from and things that we should certainly emulate in our lives. But even in this good, Jonah's bad, the root cause of all this evil and rebellion that we see flowing to the surface of Jonah, it is still there even in the best of Jonah. 
But let's begin with the good, the best of, of Jonah. Let's read again verses 1 through 3. Again, we read that this is from the inside of the fish that Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And what he prayed is this. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and God listened to my cry. God hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All of his waves and breakers, they swept over me. Here, Jonah and us as his audience, we get an undeniable reminder that those that rebel against God will experience the power of God. Think about what Jonah writes here while remembering that what Jonah said back on the boat in chapter 1. Jonah goes against God's direct and clear command. God brings the storm, he scares the sailors, and he wakes Jonah up from his slumber. The sailors are trying to figure all this out, and in the midst of that, they ask Jonah who he is and where it is that he is coming from. And remember Jonah's response. He says that, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, the God who made the sea and the dry land. Here, God gives Jonah a direct command and reminder of what that means. A direct and bold reminder that he is the God that not only made the sea and the dry land, but he is the God that still controls the sea and the dry land. Jonah says from the deep, in the realm of the dead, meaning in the place where in the sea, that if you go, you will die. Jonah says that from that place, he called to the Lord, and the Lord heard him, and the Lord saved him. Jonah says, you, and remember, he is talking to God. He says, you heard me into the depths. You hurled me into the very heart of the sea, and the currents, they swirled around me. All of your waves, God, they swept over me. Here, Jonah is getting a reality check. He's getting a reminder that God is ruler and controller over all. That his righteous right hand, it controls all. We see before Jonah's descent into the sea, Jonah has the right answers. That he could pass all the written tests and that he, that he has the right pedigree. He was a Hebrew and he worshipped the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the sea and the dry land. Jonah knew that. That was the right profession and knowledge that he possessed and, and could equate. God certainly is the God of heaven. He's certainly the God of the sea and the dry land. But apparently Jonah either forgot or didn't know that that meant that Jonah that Jonah could never run away from God. That with God, whether we try to run on the dry land or the sea, as vast as they both are, whether we can ascend to the very heavens themselves, two things are always going to happen, no matter how far away we try to run. Either we are going to be obedient, we're going to do what God wants us to do, either we are going to be a part of God's good and gracious plans coming to fruition, or we are going to experience the power of God. We're going to experience the wrath of God. God's plans are always going to come to fruition. This is an important reminder for Jonah and for us, and for us especially as people who have spent this Christmas season reminding ourselves of the rich and lavish love of God, which every aspect of that is true. But that same God of love is also a God of great and indescribable power. And he's also the God of, of wrath and judgment. That he is the God of consequences and consequences for our sin and rebellion. For our God to be the righteous judge that he is, he has to bring sin, rebellion, and disobedience to judgment. He has to bring them into the light and thus bring them in to judgment. If there was a judge in our world at any level, from the Supreme Court down, if there was a judge in that system that allowed a free-for-all, if there was a judge who no matter what, no matter the evidence, always brought down a not guilty verdict, if there was a judge who saw the mounds of evidence of wrongdoing in cases like we see piling up in the Idaho murder, if there was a judge that said even in the face of all that evidence, not guilty, what would we say of that judge? Well, we would say he is an unjust judge. We would rightly say that he is anything but a righteous judge. Well, the same is true of our God. For if the world's fantasy 
came true, if the world's fantasy of God was actually reality, if there was a God who saw no evil and condemned no evil, if that was the God of the heavens, the God of the sea and the dry land, he would be a worthless God. For if there was a power who didn't have power or didn't wield the power to bring justice, what good would that God be? And I don't know about you, but I could go about just fine if there was no such thing in my life or in the life of the world around me as sin, evil, and rebellion. Again, either my own or that of the world. I could get along just fine. But the reality is there is such a thing as sin, evil, and rebellion. And the reality is I'm a part of that sin, evil, and rebellion. The reality is there is such a thing as right and wrong, as good and evil, as truth and and lies. We in the world have proven since the beginning of time that we are horrible arbiters of these things. That we have no idea how to distinguish on our own between that which is good and that which is evil and sin. We have no, uh, no uh, fa faculties on our own to determine what is truly true. I don't want the world, I certainly don't want myself to determine what is good. Rather, I want the good God, the God who made the heavens, the God who made the sea and the dry land, and the God who made everything and everyone that walks upon it to determine what is good for that which he created. And that is what our good God does. He determines what is good because he is good. He determines what is best because he knows what is truth, because he knows what is righteous, because he is righteousness to his core. He determines the best paths for us to walk because he designed both us and the paths that we walk upon. And Jonah here got a first-hand reminder of that reality. And one of the good things that Jonah did was he shared with us the direct reminder that he got from God, that God is always going to bring to fruition that which he desires to bring to fruition. We can go kicking and screaming or we can go Willingly. If the God of the sea and the dry land calls you to take the dry land to go preach Nineveh, it doesn't matter if you try to escape that call through the sea. God's call is going to find you and he's going to get you where he wants you. God will get, to it, get your attention through the means that he determines as the good God that he is to determines to be best. God will redirect you to where it is that he wants you to go. The choice is ours. We can just go God's way from the start, or we can take our own way, but be, no, be warned that along the way, don't be surprised if you experience God's power against your rebellion. But even in God's power, even in God's wrath and judgment for our sin and rebellion, know that those that call upon the Lord will experience the salvation that God has already prepared for them long before they ever at request of it. Read again with me. Jonah continues in verses 4 through 6. He says, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters, they threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. Remember what we talked about last week. Jonah is so deep-seated in his hatred for the Ninevites that he would rather die for his sin than to go preach to the Ninevites so that they could live, in live even with their sin. He has such a righteous, in his own eyes, anger and hatred for the people of Nineveh that he would rather die than see them live and be saved. That is, that is, but that is easy to say on the safety of the boat for Jonah. And it's a lot harder to live out as he's sinking fast to his actual death in the sea. Because once Jonah has continued in his rebellion against God to the point that the sailors are forced to throw him overboard and he is struggling for life and grasping for breath, all of a sudden Jonah's not so ready to die, we see here. All of a sudden, in Jonah's rebellion from God, he's, as he's facing the consequences for that rebellion from God, Jonah's determining that maybe I don't want to die like I thought that I did. 
Jonah hated to such an intensity the compassion and love of God that would save rebellious sinners in the Ninevites that he was thinkingly that he was ready to die. But as he's actually facing death, he's all of a sudden thinking, man, I really wish there was a compassionate and loving God that would save me, a sinner. That maybe that type of God wouldn't be so bad. Jonah says in verse number four that as he sinks to the bottom of the ocean, he was still thinking as the world thinks. He thinks, well, I've been banished from God's sight, that God can't or that God won't see me as I sink to the ocean deep. That the waters, they are now engulfing me. That seaweed is wrapping around my head. I'm sinking to the very roots of the mountains. The earth itself is swallowing me up and now barring me in forever. That's what Jonah thinks is happening, that he's being banished from God's sight, that there's no way of saving him now. That's what Jonah sees happening now as he sinks to the depths of the ocean. God bringing wrath and consequence and punishment for his sin and that this wrath and punishment is unquenchable and it's never ending. That's what Jonah sees and thinks is happening. But what Jonah doesn't see is the salvation, the saving that God has already prepared for him. That God has already prepared for him long before Jonah ever realizes he needs it or certainly asks for it. Because think about it. The average person, I looked it up, I googled it, so it's true. The average person can only hold their breath underwater for one, maybe two minutes. That number likely goes down if you're in a panic as you're sinking to your death like Jonah. But either way, you can only hold your breath underwater for about one, maybe two minutes. And think about it, big fish like whales, whatever that big fish was God used, they don't swim that fast, right? Whales and large fish like them, they're known for their size, not their speed. So for God's saving fish to reach Jonah while Jonah still had breath in his lungs means that God must have had that fish in the neighborhood long before Jonah ever called to him for help. Jesus in Matthew 12 gives undeniable credit and authority to this amazing story of Jonah's saving by fish when he says in verse 40 of Matthew 12, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the large fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, they will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. In other words, a salvation greater than Jonah is here. A salvation that has been prepared long before we ever realized that we need it is here. His name is Jesus. And his is a salvation that has been prepared long before the foundations of the earth and thus long before we ever sought it. It is the salvation of God's Son crushing the head of the serpent. It is the salvation of God's Son defeating all of our sin and rebellion by taking on our flesh. By living the life that we could never and would never live. By living in that flesh, the life facing all the same trials and temptations to run away from God, to run away and rebel from His will, all the while never giving in to one of them. To living the perfectly obedient life, perfectly and wholly obedient to God and free from sin. Only to, like Jonah, sacrifice his own life, but unlike Jonah, sacrifice his own life, not in his own selfish intentions, but sacrificing his life for the good, the eternal good of others. The eternal good of all others, no matter how or how deeply those others have sinned. Sacrificing his life for the good of all others, including the worst sinners like Jonah and like the Ninevites. Then, as God's son, to spend three days in the depths of death, Three days in the deep realm of the dead, as Jonah puts it here. Three days in Hades, as our Apostles' Creed puts it. Three days in the depths of death, but then, and much more gloriously, I might add, than Jonah being spit up by a fish. For then, for Jesus, God's Son, to be raised to life again, so that now all who put their faith in Him and His new life not only get to believe in the resurrection of the dead, not only get to believe in the new life of Christ, but they get to experience and live out the new life of Christ. God's provision of this great fish is not just a cute story that we tell kids in Sunday school, but it reminds us 
that before the foundations of the earth, before we ever knew that we needed saving, that saving was prepared for us. It is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, when he says, For he chose us, meaning God. God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship and daughtership through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure, in accordance with his will. God chose to save us long before we ever knew that we needed saving. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight long before we were anything but holy and blameless. And here the Apostle Paul reminds us of a few things that we need to write upon our hearts. God predestined us for adoption, meaning that our sonship and our daughtership needed to be reinstated. That it's not a birthright. And that's because of our sin. And that our adoption comes about and only comes about through Jesus Christ. It comes about through Him being obedient to the Father's will and being obedient to God's pleasure, which is saving sons and daughters from their sin. Before the foundations of the world, God chose to save us through His Son. Through His Son's perfect descent to the deepest depth of sin, which is death, God has shown us His overflowing grace, His overflowing love, and His redeeming mercy. All things that we did not deserve, and all things that we did not even ask for before God freely gave them to us. We're reminded that through the provision of Jonah's saving fish, before Jonah ever asked for saving, much less before he ever asked for the giant fish. We can never, we will never be able to actually ask for all that God has given to us. We cannot even begin to imagine the rich love that God has given to us through His Son, the salvation that God has freely bestowed upon us for, through His Son. But yet we are, through this love and through this Son, we are adopted as sons and daughters of the living God again. And once we've experienced this great mercy, we discover, we are reminded, we know for the first time that salvation comes and only from God. Jonah, as he's on the boat, as he's running to Tarshish, he is turning everywhere but God for saving. The first reason for this is Jonah didn't think that he needed saving. Again, Jonah was a Hebrew by birthright, meaning his birthright would save him. Jonah was a man of standing in society as a prophet, meaning that his power in society would save him. Jonah was a prophet of God, meaning he thought that his religion his, and his religious acts would save him. Jonah knew that he wasn't one of, one of those people, one of those sinners over here, so he didn't need saving. Yet we see as Jonah was sinking to his certain death that came about because of his sin and rebellion, he found that he certainly was, for one, in need of saving. And yet he found that his birthright couldn't save him. He found that his standing in society had no power to save him. That even his standing as a prophet of God and all the religious act and, re and religion that came with it, it wasn't saving him in this moment. That while he wasn't one of those people, one of those types of sinners, he was still a sinner and he was still meeting the same end that awaited those sinners. That while he, he could have called on his birthright, he could have called on his standing in society, he could have reminded God that he wasn't one of those sinners, he could have called on his religious acts, but guess what? He could have called on them, but he still would have sank to his death in the ocean. Rather, Jonah comes to the same reality that all of us must come to if we are going to be saved. He came to the reality that salvation comes from the Lord alone. That saving, that life and life eternal comes from the Lord alone. This right here, this literal proclamation of Jonah, this statement of short, it's a short sentence and proclamation, but it is the center, it is the Climax, it is the crux. It is the true best of the best of the book of Jonah. It is the best. It is the thing that we can learn from and that we must apply to our lives. Salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. 
But what about the worst of Jonah? What can we learn from and not apply to our lives from Jonah? In this section of the book, when he just discovered and rightly declared that salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. For that, we have to look to both verse 10 and then use our understanding of what is to come in Jonah's life to remind ourselves that that which is commanded by God had better be carried out by his followers. Verse number 10 reads simply, The Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Jonah says a few things in response to his saving by God. One of them we've already talked about, but it's the most important reality of our lives. It's that salvation comes from the Lord alone. But before Jonah declares that, he says this. He says, those that cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Here we see, even in Jonah's experience of God's salvation over his physical life, even in his right declaration that salvation belongs to the Lord, even here, Jonah's main problem is still bubbling to the surface. Jonah says those that cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. He says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will say, what I will vow, I will make good. For I will say salvation belongs to the Lord. And you say, that, that sounds pretty good to me, but I would say, spoiler alert, Jonah does not do that throughout the rest of even this short book in its account of his life. He certainly does not do it perfectly. We will see, especially in chapter 4, that Jonah is still very much tightly clinging to his idols. That Jonah continues to forsake the great love of God for his own idols. Jonah, yes, he does go to Nineveh, and he does shout, but he doesn't shout with grateful praise to God for his salvation that reaches all sinners. The salvation that reached him in their sin and that God wants, in his sin, and that God wants to show to the Ninevites amidst their sin. No, instead, he simply says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. What Jonah wanted to have happen. Jonah doesn't go preaching, hoping, and praying that God's salvation will reach the Ninevites like it has reached him. Rather, he goes preaching, hoping, and praying that the Lord's wrath, that that power will reach them, the same wrath that God graciously led Jonah to avoid. Jonah says, I, what I have vowed, I will make good. What I have vowed, I will make good. Right here, I believe we see Jonah's main problem. It was not fixed. We see that Jonah's heart wasn't changed even after God had so miraculously and so powerfully saved his physical life. Even after the Lord had so graciously given him a chance at second life. Jonah still says, what I want to do, I'm going to do. And what Jonah wants to do is he wants to see God bring justice and judgment on those evil Ninevites. Jonah's problem is exactly what he points out. It's that those who cherish fleeting idols abandon faithful love. Those who cherish fleeting idols abandon faithful love. Jonah, even with all that God has done for him, even with all the right conclusions he came to after God saved him, even after he experienced and rightfully declared that salvation only comes from God, even knowing what we know that Jonah knows, that God is a gracious and compassionate God, that he is a God that is slow to anger and abounding in love, who relents from sending calamity on sinners. You know what Jonah has just called for and experienced? We see that Jonah was not changed by any of it, that he's still going to cling, that he's still very much clinging very tightly to his idols. We see that he still very much sees himself above everyone else, that he still very much sees himself above those Ninevites, and he will carry out the vows that he wants to carry out, but he will not carry out the commands that God gives. Those who cling to worthless, fleeting idols, abandon faithful love, and Jonah, at this point, we will see as we continue next week, and again, especially in week number four, is still very much clinging to his worthless idols. Which jo- for which Jonah, which for Jonah, it was that the fact that he was born better than those people. 
He was clinging to what he thought was his birthright to be saved by God. Rather than realizing that God's grace in saving, it's not a birthright, but it is a, a gift. A gift that is not only given to Jonah, a gift that is not only given to Israel and, and God's quote-unquote people, but it's given to all people. And it's given to all people as a gift. It's given to even those evil Ninevites. Jonah's heart, even tasting of the Lord's great extravagant salvation, has not been softened. It has not been changed. He was still clinging to worthless idols and thus foregoing the chance to live in the lavish and faithful love of God. The love that calls those who experience the love of God to not only live in it, but to share it with everyone. So the challenge is for us, as those that have experienced this lavish love, is, is have we been changed by it? Have we been changed by the love of God that we've spent so much of our time declaring to ourselves? Do we know that salvation comes from the Lord alone? But not only that, in following our Lord, do we actively seek to share that love and salvation with all those in which we come encounter with? This is the question that we have to ask ourselves in light of Jonah's story. I can't answer that question, nor can anyone else answer that question. But the answer to that question comes only through allowing the Holy Spirit to answer that question in prayer. But the sort of aid in that, I will leave you with six questions that you can ask yourself prayerfully throughout the week. I believe they're in your sermon outline, in your bulletin. These are not my own questions, but they actually come from an article written by Aaron Summers on LifeWay Research. I won't spend much time on them because they're, they're not for me to answer, but just to ask. The first one is, am I genuinely interested in the spiritual condition of others? Do I care if the Ninevehs of my day, if the Ninevite people of my day, do I care if they live in Christ or if they die in their sin? Do I actually care? Am I invested in their eternal life? Second one is, do I initiate conversations that point to Jesus? Do I try to be a light in this dark world? For example, when you go to the grocery store, do you keep to yourself? Do you keep your head down? Do you use your self-checkout and escape as quickly as possible to the quiet and comfort of your car? Or do you allow yourself to be open to conversations that God could open up for you? Do you engage the fallen world that is around you? Do you make yourself available to the things that God is already working on? Do you make a Jesus-like impact on others? We all will make an impact. We all do make an impact on others and those that are around us. We are all leaving our mark on others. The question is, is that mark and is that impact a Jesus-like impact? Do we present the same selves that we present in church to our unsaved family, friends, and acquaintances? Do we intentionally seek to follow up with people and others? What I mean by that is when God opens the doors to relationship, when God opens the doors to conversations that help people take one step closer to Jesus, whatever that step is, do we follow up on those movements of God? Or do we just walk away and allow the busyness of this world to cover over the things that God already is doing? Do we invite others to believe and follow Jesus? When the opportunity comes to, to do it, to, when the opportunity comes, do we make clear that Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith, that he is that which that we hope in, that him and him alone is who we follow and trust in? When God opens the door, do we follow him or do we fear man? And finally, do we guide others in Christ-like discipleship? Are there people in our lives that we are doing life with and are we seeking to do life with them in a Jesus-like way? Are there people in your life that you can say that you very clearly and intentionally are helping, people, helping them know and follow Jesus in a deeper way and thus are they helping you? know and follow Jesus in a deeper way. Today, we declare to our newest members and those that have been here for the longest time, we remind ourselves of our purpose 
as Peckway Church and, and the church, that which we've all joined together, that we've all been joined together as the body of Christ. And that is to ourselves personally and intimately know and follow Jesus Christ. And as ones that are seeking to personally and intimately know Jesus, then we cannot help but actively seek to help others know and follow Jesus. For once we have tasted and seen of this great salvation, how can we believe that there is anything else worth pursuing? How can we cling to worthless idols when we have a love of such indescribable value, just simply given to us and given to the waiting, perishing world? Today we are reminded that those who cherish fleeting idols abandon faithful love. So I say to each and every one of us, I say to myself, don't be a Jonah. Give thanks to God that a greater Jonah has come by telling everyone of his ways. By telling everyone you can come into contact with of his salvation. By telling everyone that you come into contact with his name, you know it, it is Jesus Christ. Let's pray to him now. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we are thanking you for who you are and the great things that you have done for us, the things that you have done for us long before we ever knew that we needed great things to be done. The great things you did, even seeing our sin, even knowing every sin that we have and will commit, Lord, as great and as many as they might be, that you willingly, as God's Son, left your royal throne, ascended into our flesh, lived our life in that flesh, the perfect life that we could never live, perfectly obedient to God, his good ways and his pleasure, only to lay that good life down as the once and for all sacrifice for each and every one of our sins and all the sins of this world, Lord. Lord, today we thank you that as your people and as your church, we have professed our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and through that and our belief in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we get to be saved by his grace, Lord. That there's no works of our hands, there's no birthright that we could have or earn that can save us, only the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we get to experience that. But today, we praise you that we get to share that. That we get to proclaim that with all that you put us in contact with. So Lord, we ask you to take away the Jonah in our heart and to fill it with Jesus-like heart for those that are around us, Lord. Lord, we thank you today that we get to celebrate and officially welcome three new members into our fellowship, Lord. But what we really desire as your people, as Peckway Church, as the Evangelical Congregational Church, is to see new members come not only to this church, but into the family of God. Lord, we seek to fill the streets of heaven, not the pews of this church, Lord. We seek to see the church grow as new believers are being baptized into the faith, Lord. And so we ask for that to happen. As new believers are declaring their faith, are making their stand upon the rock that is Jesus Christ. That is what we seek. And so to see that happen, Lord, we ask for you to make us more like your son. For you to mold us, shape us, and bend us to be more like your son. For it's in his great name that we pray. And it's in his great name that we trust. The name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, oh, Julia's already up here. <laughs> I'm going to make a quick audible before Julia leads. If Andrew and Mary Jane could just come up at, like we normally do and lead the song, and then we'll receive members at the end. So, quick audible. Sorry. Sounds so great. You can do the song, yeah. <laughs> 